Okay, so um, today we have to finish at uh, one o'clock on the dot. So um, what I propose to do is to start immediately and just keep talk through, keep talking through for an hour and a half without a break. If that's uh, if that's okay. Um, so I'll begin with some uh, geometric background. Um, so the main space we're going to work on is M11, the moduli stack of elliptic curve. Um, so there'll be two different main ways of thinking about this. The first um, is over the complex numbers. And um, so over C, we will think of M11, or sometimes I'll write M11 an, simply as the orbifold quotient of the upper half plane by gamma. So um, I'll put it here. So H maybe I'll, I'll be consistent and call this tor. So H is the upper half plane, and gamma throughout this lecture will be SL2Z and nothing else. OK, so we have the orbifold quotient, and this is very easy to work with. Uh, roughly speaking, geometric objects on M11an, such as local systems, or vector bundles, and so on, um, can be viewed as objects upstairs on H, which are gamma equivariant. So we'll see examples of these. Um, then we have the um, universal elliptic curve. So really, um, really it's, it's, it's the analytic universal elliptic curve, and it is described again as a quotient as an orbifold C cross H over gamma, that's correct, semi-direct Z2. So gamma is going to act on the right on Z2. And let me give the actions on C cross H. So if gamma is A, B, C, D, uh, a matrix in SL2Z, then gamma of Z tor is Z over C tor plus D. And then gamma acts on tor in the usual way, A tor plus B over C tor plus D. Um, and then for Mn in Z squared, we have um, Mn Z tor equals Z plus M tor plus N, and tor stays put. OK, so that defines um, the, the, the universal elliptic curve over C. Um, and Concretely, um, a, a point in M1N is an um, isomorphism class of elliptic curves E, and the fiber over that point is the elliptic curve itself. So that's one way to think about um, M11, which is very classical. Um, and the second way will be much more algebraic. And I'll only need to work over Q, but we can do better. We can work over the field. Uh, sorry, the ring K of the integers with 12 inverted. And uh, to do this, it's convenient to work with a slightly different space, um, which I learned about from, from Decane. Um, so M1 vector 1 is rather nice. It's the moduli, not stack, but it's a scheme of um, elliptic curves E um, with 
the data, so over C at least, with the data of a non-zero tangent vector um, V in the tangent space of the elliptic curve at the identity. So over C it's some picture like this, you have some, some non-zero tangent vector sticking out <coughs> of um, the tangent space at the identity. Um, now, a more algebraic way to think about this, an elliptic curve with the data of such a tangent vector is equivalent to the data of the elliptic curve with an abelian differential. So omega is in H naught um, is a section of its of its chief of holomorphic differentials um, and such that its pairing with with V is is one for example. Another way to say that is that the V defines, well, the, 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 um, the tangent bundle is trivial, and so the data of a non-zero tangent vector here dually gives a non-zero um, uh, holomorphic differential all over the whole curve. Okay, so this has now a very algebraic description. Such a curve E, we could represent it by an equation, y squared equals 4x cubed minus ux minus V. And the abelian differential we write as dx over y. And uh, so the point is that if you if you you, you scale this in the usual manner, um, then this um, that will define an isomorphic elliptic curve. But this differential will also get scaled. And more importantly, that when when y goes to minus y, so you have this this involution then you, you don't detect it here, but you do detect it on, on this differential omega because it will change sign. And that's the reason that this is a scheme and not a, not a stack. So very explicitly, we can write this as, an, as um, m1 vector 1 is simply the affine. So, so this uh, elliptic, this is, a, this is smooth, so th uh, this, this um, equation has to have vanishing discriminant. So the space of such, these equations are parameterized by, by A2 with coordinates u and v minus the locus where the discriminant vanishes. So d uh, here and from now on will be u cubed minus 27v squared, which is actually one sixteenth of the discriminant of this equation. We don't care about the 16, especially since we're inverting 2. So um, M11 is, is very explicitly uh, this, uh, this complement in two-dimensional affine space. And it's just spec of K uh, U V 1 over delta. So, so here A, A is the its coordinates U V. OK, so this. Um, this defines a very explicit um, scheme. And uh, it's affine ring, which is this thing here, m1, 1, vector 1, um, has a GM action uh, emits a grading. So I think of this as a GM action, action of the multiplicative group. And it's the usual one. It's the one that gives u weight 4 and v weight 6. So u, v. Um, by the action of, of a point lambda in GM of Q, for example, becomes lambda to the minus 4U, lambda to the minus 6V. Um, and, and then with this description, so this is a, a very nice scheme, um, we can think of M11 as the stack quotient um, M11 vector 1 uh, by, by the action of GM. So that means that objects on M11 will be viewed as GM equivalent objects on this very concrete scheme. 
And in this language, the, the Dean Mumford compactification, which we won't need today, um, is just GM quotient of A2 minus the origin. Okay, and in this language, the universal elliptic curve um, is very explicit. Where should I put it? I'll, I'll, um, oh, I'll just write it up here. So the universal elliptic curve over m on vector 1, so it comes with this tangent vector or this non-abelian differential. It's just explicitly the spectrum of O uh, M11, one, one, which is just this ring over here, adjoined x, y, modulo the equation y squared equals 4x cubed minus ux minus v. Or the ideal generated by that equation. So this is all very concrete. Um, so now I want to describe some, some local system. First, a, a local system on, the, on M11 AN, and then secondly, an algebraic vector bundle with integrable connection on, on, on M11. Um, so this, this is all very classical. Um, so we're going to give ourselves a, um, a family of canonical local systems on M11 AN. And out of these, I'll define the Betty version of relative completion. It will be built out of these. So these are, if you like, sort of the, the basic simple building blocks out of which we're going to construct iterated extensions, which are going to be very complex. So um, this is what you think it is. Uh, H is going to be R, um, R1 pi lower star Q. So I forgot to say what pi was. Pi is this map. Um, and Q is the constant sheaf on uh, the elliptic curve. And then therefore, this de describes a rank 2 local system um, of Q vector spaces um, and it can be described very concretely the, the fiber its fiber over E is simply um, the cohomology group E uh, H1 of E with coefficients in Q, which is a, a two-dimensional Q vector space. And now define in the usual manner um, V N B B for Betty, because this is really B B Betty cohomology we're working with. So this will be the um, nth symmetric power of H. And therefore, it is a rank n plus 1 um, local system on M11 and. So we think of that, well, we can think of that very concretely um, by the principle described earlier. A local system on M11 and is the same thing as a Q vector space of the same dimension plus the data of an action of gamma. Um, right, now let me briefly just describe the, the dual, uh, the, the dual um, local system to this. So th this local system has a dual. Um, and its fibers are H uh, homology. So this can be described very explicitly. So if our elliptic curve, oh, this is that we we're working over C here, of course, um, is C modulo the lattice tor Z plus Z, then we have the uh, the usual picture for um, a fundamental domain for this action 
with zero here, tors in the upper half plane, so it's up here, one, we call this A and we call this B. Then, then A and B um, generate the homology, um, this homology group. So A and B are a basis of this. Um, and now to, to, to fit with the, the, start, the modular forms um, community notation, I'm going to switch notation and I'm going to write x equals minus b and y equals minus a. Um, and I'm not 100% sure about the signs here. It could be plus. You can take it plus if you like. But it makes no difference whatsoever because there are no modular forms of odd weight in this context. So it, it's impossible to say. Um, and then, um, so this local system then can simply be viewed as, as the vector space qx direct sum qy. So this is the absolutely standard notation um, in, uh, in this business, um, where v has a right action of gamma, uh, where if we have gamma equals a, b, c, d, um, x, y maps to x plus b, y, c, x plus d, y. And this notation, this is, this is denoted by a slash. So uh, v, the action of gamma, is denoted by a slash on the right. Uh, so this is unfortunate because some people uh, work with a left action. The uh, modular forms community works with a right action. At some point, you can't have your cake and eat it. And so I'm going to use right actions from now on. Um, but at some point, this is going to come back and, and, and cause some trouble. Um, you can't get away with having left actions everywhere in this business. And there comes a, a point where you have to make a decision. Um, this is absolutely standard in the modular forms community, people who do period polynomials and so on. So I adopted this. The problem with right actions is that we, we, we write uh, in, in English from left to right, and there comes a point where it just becomes unworkable. But th this is very good for now. So later on, I will, I will probably have to switch to a left action, I'm afraid. Anyway, so I leave you to, to struggle with these, with these irritating difficulties. Um, but then, so modulo this, this question of switching between left and right actions that I don't want to get into, um, we can think of this vector bundle as uh, simply, the, the symmet this n-symmetric power of this vector space is simply um, the space of polynomials, or uh, ho homogeneous polynomials in two variables of degree n, plus right action of gamma. And so this is, the, this is the, the convention that I'm going to adopt. Right, so that's, um, that's a, those are local systems. And now um, we want some um, algebraic vector bundles. So now we um, define, um, so these are going to be the, the building blocks for the Duran relative completion, which is going to be built out of iterated extensions of these building blocks in the same way that Betty relative completion will be built out of these building blocks. So in a consistent way, I'm going to call V Duran H. Um, you can put a 1 here if you like. Is going to be... Um, H1 of the universal elliptic curve relative to M1 vector 1, which is scheme, plus the Gaussmannian connection, as, as defined by Katz and Oda. So this can be written down very explicitly as follows. So 
So now we're working on m1 vector 1 and this very explicit scheme with a, the defining equation over there. Um, so what it is, it's, a tri it's actually a trivial, the underlying vector bundle is trivial. So it's a trivial rank 2 coherent sheaf, um, which is just the, the affine ring m1 vector 1. Um, and then some generator S and another generator T. So I'm using blackboard letters because later on S and T are going to denote the standard elements in SL2Z that I'm going to call S and T. So this is just to avoid confusion with elements in the group. Um, and um, so what it, it's going to be GM equivalent, so there's going to be a GM action, or if you prefer, if S and T have some, some weight. So lambda of S uh, is lambda times S, and lambda acting on T is lambda inverse of T. And what S and T correspond to, so S corresponds to uh, so, well, T corresponds to the holomorphic differential dx over y, and S corresponds to x dx over y in, uh, on, on this, uh, in, in this uh, notation here. So we have, um, you can show that this, this, this defines a, um, a, a, a trivial bundle. These two forms are always linear, linearly dependent. And um, to compute the Gaussmannian connection, you differentiate. So these two one forms are closed on each fiber, on each elliptic curve. But as on the family, they're not closed. So you differentiate them to get two forms. And you rewrite the two forms as one forms on the base times something that you re-express in terms of this basis of, of one forms S and T. And you can always do that. And when you do it, you get a certain formula, which is very elementary, but um, a bit of a chore to compute. And it can be written, so the connection on, on this is given by D plus um, S T times a certain matrix of one forms, psi omega minus u over 12 omega minus psi d by ds, d by dt. And I should explain what these forms are. I thought it's nice to give this complete, it's completely explicit, so it's nice to write it down. And I think that the first person to write this down was, was uh, uh, Katz uh, in an appendix to, to a paper and in a volume um, in some Antwerp proceedings in, in the early 70s, I think. So these, these forms are very explicit. Psi equals um, d delta, the discriminant, with 1 over 12. Um, and omega equals 3 over 2, 2 du dv minus 3 v du over delta. And I mind you that delta is this thing over there. Okay, so this is this um, connection is 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 GM equivariant. You can check that, and therefore, um, therefore it defines a um, um, defines an algebraic vector bundle plus integrable connection. on M downstairs on M, sorry, on, on M11, not M1 vector 1. So a priori, this is defined on M1 vector 1 on the scheme, and we view a, an algebraic vector bundle with integrable connection on the stack quotient as being a GM equivariant such object upstairs on M1, M1 vector 1. And I forgot to say that actually this, this, um, this has regular singularities at infinity. It's very easy to compute the residue at, at the point Q equals 0. Um, and, and check it's nilpotent. 
and so on and so forth. Um, so then we finally we define Vn Duram is the nth symmetric power uh, plus its connection, which is given by uh, exactly that formula. Right, and um, what I wanted to say that one of these forms, I think omega um, essentially, th this thing looks a bit complicated, but it, it really corresponds to dq over q morally. So there's a map, an analytic map from the upper half plane to this, and, and you, if you work it out, so you, you should, should think of U as, as Eisenstein series, and V is Eisenstein series of weights uh, 4 and 6, respectively. And if you compute this, you get exactly dq over q coming out. So this looks complicated, but it's, it's something very familiar. Um, and then there's the, the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence gives um, a, an isomorphism between this Betty local system and this algebraic vector bundle. So V and B tensor O, where am I working? M11 one one an. It's isomorphic to V and RAM tensor O, where this means that you're already working upstairs in some sense. Um, and briefly, so to the, the element T here, because it T corresponds to D, dx over y, um, if you integrate dx over y along A and B, um, you get 1 and tau, and, and you can check that this corresponds to, up to some possible power of 2 pi i, it corresponds to x minus tau y with possibly some sine and some 2 pi i here. OK, so this is very um, classical. So before proceeding, for, and these are the basic building blocks that we're going to use. Sorry? And this isomorphism, where s goes? Uh, no, I don't want to compute s. I don't want to compute s. I think it involves, it, it, it's, it's more complicated. I don't want to say what s is. Um, so cohomology so um, so by an extension of, of Grotendieck's theorem on uh, from 1964 on the algebraic Durham cohomology in which he defined algebraic Duram cohomology. So this is you have to extend this because we're working with um, vector bundles. That's no problem. And we're also working over stack, so you have to say some words. But it, it's it's it really um, no big deal. This is just Grothendieck's theorem. He shows that there is a canonical isomorphism um, which is called a comparison isomorphism from the algebraic Duram cohomology of M11 with coefficients in this algebraic vector bundle tensored with C, and that's isomorphic to, um, what should I call it? Well, I think of this as Betty, cohomo Betty cohomology, so you can put a B here if you like. It's just singular cohomology, M11 analytic with coefficients in the Betty vector bundle tensor with C. And, and when you do this isomorphism, this is essentially given by integration, and it produces numbers. It produces periods. So I'm now going to explain in more detail what these things are and say some words about the periods, because uh, it's astonishing, but it, a lot of this didn't seem to be anywhere in the literature um, until very, very recently. So let's first describe uh, th this space. Um, so because of the orbifold description of M11 analytic, it was just simply connected space quotiented by SL2Z. Then this right-hand side is simply computable in terms of the group cohomology of its fundamental group. So it's H1 gamma. Um, in this vector space Vn. Vn was the, this, this uh, vector space uh, up here of um, dimension n plus 1. 
So this is just group cohomology, and I gave the definition last time explicitly in terms of uh, co-cycles modulo boundaries. And then the question is then, what, what is this, what is um, H1 Duram? What is this left-hand side? And so this should have some description in terms of modular forms. So now let me describe um, the Duram cohomology. So um, let's uh, let's write M. So M, this is not a non-calligraphic M to distinguish from the moduli space. This is just a, a Roman M. M factorial N plus 2 is defined to be the space of what are known as weakly holomorphic modular forms um, of weight N plus 2 with rational Fourier coefficients. So this is a vector space over Q, rational Fourier coefficients. It's an infinite dimensional vector space over Q. Um, so what is it? it? It's the set of functions f from the upper half plane to C, uh, which are holomorphic, holomorphic on, on H, such that they are modular. So f of A tor plus B over C tor plus D equals C tor plus D to the n plus 2 f tor. So they're modular of weight n plus 2. Um, and furthermore, that um, on the Q disk, oops, I forgot to say, um, so here, Q, Q equals, of course, e to the 2 pi i tor. So um, because they're, they're translation invariant, they have a Fourier expansion, and the point is that they have a, they need to have a Laurent expansion at the disk. So we suppose that they have a Laurent expansion um, of this form. They can, but it's, it's, the point here is weak, weakly means that you're allowed to have poles uh, at Q equals zero. Um, and, and the other condition is that um, the Fourier coefficients are all rational numbers. So this is a, a vector space. Um, and yeah, so what I want to say though, so we weakly here means that you're allowed a pole at Q equals zero, but nowhere else. It's the only pole you're allowed. So there's a, a pole, poles at the cusp, and, but you're holomorphic everywhere else on H. Um, so now let's, we have, so the, the, the usual space, the more familiar space of holomorphic modular forms is contained in the weakly holomorphic modular forms. And inside the holomorphic modular forms, we have cusp forms. So these are the subspace of functions which are holomorphic at the cusp. So in this definition, it means that um, n equals zero. So there's no, no pole at Q equals zero. And this is a cusp form. It's holomorphic at the cusp. And the first Fourier coefficient A naught, the constant term, vanishes. Um, so now on this space of weakly holomorphic modular forms, there's an operator Q d by dQ, uh, which is often called the bowl operator. And so you can certainly take such a, a, a Laurent expansion and differentiate it term by term. But that, in general, will not be a modular form. It will, it will destroy this, um, this, this property. So it does not respect or preserve modularity. But what Boll showed was uh, I think in the 1950s, Boll showed that if you take, uh, 
apply this operator many times. So if you take to the, the n plus one power of this operator, then it in fact does preserve modularity if you restrict to the, the space of the correct modular weight. So if you look at modular forms of weight minus n, then the n plus one power by some coincidence, well, some accident, some miracle, uh, gives you modular forms of weight n plus two. So that's uh, Bowles, a consequence of Bowles' theorem. So, but this sort of does. And what I've got to mention here is that, that, of course, there are no holomorphic modular forms of negative weights, but there are many um, weakly holomorphic modular forms of negative weights. In fact, this is an infinite dimensional vector space. Okay, so the, the theorem then um, is that you can describe this cohomology explicitly in terms of these uh, weakly holomorphic modular forms. Um, what are the properties? Well, I'm um, not sure I have anything particularly interesting to say. I mean, yeah, I mean, clearly there are properties that follow from the fact that it's this explicit differential operator. Um, I mean, the, the only thing I can add to this is it lands in the space of cusp forms. So there's a, there's a notion S factorial, which is the subspace where A0 vanishes. That's a useful property that, that I won't need, but that's the only thing that I can add, really. I mean, there's another way you can factorize this. this um, the, the best way to see this is to factorize this in terms of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic differential operators, each of which does preserve modularity. And um, it's a better way to think about it. Um, okay, so theorem is that there exists a canonical isomorphism um, from weakly holomorphic modular forms modulo the image of the ball operator. So you want to think of sort of n plus one fold derivatives of forms of weight minus n as trivial in some sense, is isomorphic to the algebraic Duram cohomology um, and the map is uh, 2f you assign f omega t, which is a section of, um, of this. So that's wrong. It must be f t to the n. I'm mistaken my notes. f omega t to the n. So that's, that's a, 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 a section of V n Duram, and you have to check that it's closed under the, it's annihilated by uh, Nabla, and that this, in fact, um, is zero on this and, and defines an isomorphism of cohomology. Um, so a remark, um, remark is that this space M factorial has, has a very natural description. We can think of it as the piece of weight N plus 2 in Q tensor um, OM1 vector 1, which is nothing other than this, the piece of graded weight n plus 2 in the ring q u v 1 over delta. So here u has uh, weight 4 and v has weight 6, maybe the other way around, and delta has weight 12. And so every weakly holomorphic modular form is, is a polynomial in Eisenstein series g4 and g6 divided by some power of the Ramanujan cusp form. That's what it's saying. Um, so this theorem, so I'm a bit embarrassed to say but that um, it was clear from reading the modern literature on modular forms that this theorem was not known. And so I suggested to my collaborator, Richard Hain, that we, we, we write it up. Um, and then later on, it was pointed out to us that, that, that it kind of was known. Um, so the history is sort of complicated. Uh, it was proved most recently by Scholl and well, I think the first proof explicitly in the literature is Kazaliski 
in 2016, somewhat surprisingly. Um, a lot of this is implicit already in Scholl's work in the 90s. Um, but also, there's a similar statement in the Piatic setting, um, for, uh, but we have to remove the subsingular locus. It's a slightly different statement. Due to Coleman in 96, I think. Uh, then uh, this was redone very recently by Candelori um, in, in 2014. And uh, the study of this left-hand space is where I learned about it, was um, in a paper by um, Gersoy in 2008. So Gersoy showed, in fact, that you can, that this space here, that this quotient splits in some sense, that you can always represent elements here in this quotient as simply weakly holomorphic modular forms whose pole in Q is bounded above by the space of cusp forms. So this has quite an explicit description. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so the, 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 these, are, these proofs are, are essentially the same, and they use the fact that you work on a scheme, so you work on a, on a, on a higher level uh, modular curve, and then you deduce this um, um, from that. Um, but my proof with Richard Hain is just a, a direct, direct proof on, on the stack straight off. So myself and, and Hain uh, did this in 2017, and I tried to give a fair account of the history, which is somewhat complicated. Okay, so this, um, this space here has a Hodge filtration. So um, the Hodge filtration, so this would be a, a Roman M. So this is a holomorphic modulus forms. Under this isomorphism, the subspace of holomorphic modular forms corresponds exactly to F n plus 1. So, um, so here we have a, a Durham thing and a, and a Betty thing that are, that are compared via some canonical comparison isomorphism. In fact, you can go much further and show that um, either the left-hand side or the right-hand side is, is the Durham realization of an actual motive, of a pure motive. And this was done by Scholl um, in the mid-'80s. And uh, much later, there's another construction of this due to Consani and Faber uh, on the moduli space um, of elliptic curves. OK, so um, this actually comes from a motive. Let me describe it quickly, depending on how much time. Um, so let me describe it. Um, so as probably we all know, um, let me just write that the Durham realization decomposes um, into cusp forms, an Eisenstein part and a cuspidal part. Uh, and this decomposition is actually motivic. It's actually true on the level of, of the motives. So it splits. And then let me tell you what each piece looks like. Um, so what, what are the Hodge numbers? So the Hodge types of, of the cuspidal stuff, what well it's of type n plus 1, 0, and 0 n plus 1. And the Eisenstein part is of type, has hot numbers n plus 1, n plus 1. So in fact, um, as, a, as, as a motive, it's, it's just a Q of, it's going to be one dimensional, or at most one dimensional, and it's going to be, as a hot structure, it's going to be Q of minus n minus 1. I'm not going to say much about hot structures today, but I will next time. 
So then, so what is this? This is generated, so this Eisenstein part is generated by, um, by Eisenstein series. Um, so G n plus 2, of weight n plus 2, for all n big and equal to 2. It vanishes otherwise. And so I remind you that G, um, the Eisenstein series GK is a um, modular form of weight K, whose constant Fourier coefficient is a Bernoulli number plus the sum sigma K minus 1 m q to the m. So this is the normalization that we are going to take for Eisenstein series. And of course, it has rational Fourier coefficients, um, in fact, integral Fourier coefficients um, from here onwards, <coughs> as indeed you expect. So now, so that's the, that's the description of the Eisenstein part. It's, it's very concrete. Um, on the cuspidal part, um, it's a little bit more tricky. But if we extend scalars, so if we tensor this, this is a, a, a motive of a Q. So this is Duram is a, it's a Q vector space. But if we tensor with Q bar, you can, you can get away with a lot less, but let's tensor over Q bar for simplicity, then this thing um, admits an action, well, it, it admits an action of Hecker operators anyway, but over Q bar it will decompose into eigenspaces. So over Q bar it decomposes as a motive into, um, uh, in, as a direct sum of um, pure motives V. So I realize I've massive, I'm overusing the, the letter V. Um, but, but let me, well, let me not make a, a, a dangerous change at this stage. So V lambda will be, so this will be the sum of uh, um, cuspidal Hecker eigenspaces. And each V lambda is of rank 2. So it's a two-dimensional Q bar. Uh, its randomization is a, is a two-dimensional Q bar vector space and with, with these uh, Hodge numbers. It's just actually a motive over Q, a pure motive over Q bar. Okay, good. So le now let's um, just do an example in weight 12 to get a feel for it. So in, in weight 12 is the first interesting case. So n equals 10. Um, then there's this, this, this space of, of weakly holomorphic modular forms here. Modulo this quotient can, every, can be represented by the following three modular forms. We have G12, the Eisenstein series, which is a holomorphic modular form in M12. Then we have the Ramanujan cusp form, delta, um, which is Q minus 24 Q squared plus 252 Q cubed, dot, 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 which is a cusp form, weight 12. And then something else, because the motive of the cusp form is rank 2, so there should be another Durham class. It's given by something called the, 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 we call delta prime. And as Gerzoi showed, that you can represent classes in this quotient um, uh, uniquely if you de decide that, if you, you uh, impose the condition that the pole is at most, that it has poles of order at most the dimension of the space of cusp forms. So here the space of cusp forms is one dimensional. So if we, we can force it to, to we, can, we can choose a representative that begins q to the minus one plus something. And um, here's what it looks like. Dot, 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 dot. And this is in M12 um, factorial. 
Um, so this you can write down explicitly as some weight um, 24 modular form divided by, divided by delta. Um, and, and in fact, it determines it uniquely. And so the, the Duram realization of the motive associated to delta is the two-dimensional vector space spanned by delta and delta prime. Right, so we've got a holomorphic modular form and a weakly holomorphic modular form. Did you hear a word about the incorporate all the because they act in cursed forms? Uh, yeah, they do. So that's the, that's the point. So this is what I learned from Gerzoy's paper. Um, so the Hecker operators preserve this subspace. Um, so that's a property of the Boll operator. Um, the, the, the heck operators preserve this subspace and therefore the, the heck operators act on this quotient. But that's a subtle thing because if you, if you take a weakly holomorphic modular form like delta prime, you apply the heck what the heck operators do is they increase the order of the pole. So, you, so if you apply the heck operator to delta prime, you get some something and then you have to subtract off some, some, something in, in this guy, some differential, and then you'll get back a multiple of delta prime, and it'll have the same Hecker eigenvalues as delta. Yeah. So that's the subtlety. So, th so uh, delta satisfies a Hecker eigenvalue equation. It's an, a, a genuine eigenfunction, but delta prime is an eigenfunction with an inhomogeneous term. Yeah. You get something like, I don't know, t TP of delta prime equals lambda pre P delta prime plus ball operator, whatever it is, 11 of psi p, and p is going to depend on, on the prime. So that's what it means to be a Hecker eigen, um, eigen function in, in, this, in this setting. Yes, it's very interesting, and, and I, I don't know if people have really studied very much the, well, there, there are some papers studying the arithmetic properties of these coefficients, but they've not, they're not completely mainstream. Um, and, but I think they're extremely interesting, and clearly absolutely central to this story. They don't they rightfully deserve a central place in the theory. Okay, so now periods, um, which was uh, my motivation with, with, with Hain for, for proving this theorem because we wanted to know that this was the correct Q structure in which to define uh, the periods of the motives of a modular form. <laughs> Indeed, it was known. So the corollary of, of Grotendieck's um, uh, result over on that board is that that this quotient here um, is canonically isomorphic to, via the comparison isomorphism, to H1 gamma Vn tensor C. And the map, uh, if you work it all out, is F goes to the co-cycle, which to uh, an element of SL2z assigns the integral from gamma inverse tor zero to tor zero, two pi i to the n plus one f of tor times x minus tor y to the n d tor. And this is true for, for any, this holds, for, if you, you pick any uh, point on the upper half plane, you integrate along the geodesic from the, the, the gamma inverse axis on tor zero. There's a unique geodesic given by gamma between gamma inverse t zero and t zero. And this gives you some polynomial in x and y. This defines a co-cycle. And if you modify your choice of tor zero, then that modifies that by co-boundary. And so the cohomology class of this is uh, well-defined, and it's the canonical comparison isomorphism. So there's a, I could, talk for a long time about this, but let me just make a couple of brief words. But this is not the, the Eichler-Shimura isomorphism is a, is a weaker statement than this. So what the Eichler-Shimura um, isomorphism theorem says 
So this is stronger than the classical Eichler Shimura theorem, which states, well, which we, we often write in the following way. It's the same thing, it's the same map, but applied only to holomorphic modular forms and to complex conjugates of cusp forms. And, and it is true that this gives an isomorphism. So I'm being a little bit sloppy, you have to take positive invariant and anti-invariant parts, but let me just sort of get to the punchline. The, the, the point is that if you do this, the Eichler-Shimura isomorphism, then it only produces, this will only produce for you um, two periods for each motive of a modular form, um, for each v-lambda. But the theorem here actually gives, the, the theorem actually generates, so this Corolli actually generates all, all the periods, all four periods. So the, the theorem generates and the quasi-periods. And the example to, bear, to think of um, is, for example, if you have an elliptic curve, uh, you, you have the periods where you integrate over the A and B cycles of dx over y. These are the, the periods, and there are two of them. And the Eichler-Shimura theorem gives you exactly the, the two periods in, in the modular analog. But as we know from an elliptic curve, to get the full matrix of periods, you have to consider differential forms of the second kind. And these are called quasi-periods. And the, the Eichler-Shimura theorem, so this is the period matrix, if you like, in a certain basis. The Eichler-Shimura theorem is only giving you this column, uh, whereas this, the, the, the full comparison isomorphism is, is a full period matrix, and it, and it gives this column as well. So, and that was the reason for, for doing this, this work, was, was to, to sort this out. So, in fact, it, it seems to me to be the case that even for the case of this motive here, the, the Ramanujan uh, cost function, I don't think that the quasi-periods were known or hadn't been computed, at least I couldn't find it in the literature, and they're very useful, they, they turn up in physics and, and in, in all sorts of other places. Right, so that's, um, that's all quite classical in principle. Um, now, now I want to um, talk about relative completion. So, so far everything is pure motives, it's all abelian, we're talking about cohomology, we're not talking about fundamental groups, and so now we're going to make it all non-abelian. Um, and the first technical point that we need is um, the notion of tangential base point. Um, and this notion is due to Deligne. You yeah. get the four period. If you start from V lambda, yeah. you map to the H1, and then uh, what's, what's the next step? What, what do you expect the four period? Well, do you want, you want to know how to get the four periods from this? We have delta, so you, you, do, you apply this to delta and delta prime. This gives you some, some um, thing, and then H1 gamma has an action of epsilon, which is the, the Frobenius. So you have um, epsilon, it's something like x, y maps to x minus y, for example. And then you have h1 gamma vn plus or minus. So you take uh, uh, p plus, so, so in, in, in this weight, in weight 10, you've got um, an Eisenstein co-cycle, uh, an Eisenstein class, and you've got uh, a, a positive cos one and negative one. And the image under S is, is you can find a representative as a co-cycle, which is the well-known, and it's x to the 10 minus y to the 10, 36 over 691, 691 over 36, plus three, I don't know, I'm making this up, x squared minus y squared, yeah, whatever. You get a two by two matrix here. But already, also for the Eisenstein case, I mean, to, um, you actually get a canonical co-cycle in the Eisenstein case. I'll talk about that next time. And to, make, to, to get it canonical, you need a tangential base point. So there are a lot of very basic things here that, that are sort of not 
in the literature, but that that um, um, that can be made canonical and, and very explicit. And we'll we'll need them. So that if you look at the period of the Eisenstein series, you're going to get a zeta value. Um, which is the period of a mixed motive. That's very interesting. And, but if you look at the periods of the cusp forms, we're going to get exactly um, these four numbers, the periods and the quasi-periods. So for Eisenstein, you get one, one period? So for the Eisenstein series, we get two powers of 2 pi i yeah. and an odd zeta value. And we have two, 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 two. How, Sorry, how do you mean? No, there's, there's, one, oh, there's one integral, because, because the Eisenstein part is, is either plus or minus invariant. I can't remember. It, 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 there's only one eigenspace. One it's one by one. So this, this splits into cusp, and then there's H1 Eisenstein gamma Vn, which I think is, is anti-invariant or something. So this is one-dimensional, this is two-dimensional. And, and there are a lot of uh, things in, written in the literature about these Eisenstein clusters that, they're not, that, are, that are very confusing. So maybe next time I'll, I'll, I'll say some more about these periods and then explain how it, you get the non-abelian periods afterwards. So I more, you get the conjugate. Get yeah, exactly. You're, you're taking you're taking this column, and the, the complex and the complex conjugate of this column here. So you're getting two copies of the same thing, and you're just taking the complex conjugate. So it's absolutely. I mean, we do write this all the time, but it's absolutely not. The, 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 it's not the the right. Well, it's not the, the not the statement that we want. Um, okay, so I have half an hour. Um, tangential base points. So. I maybe have to um, abbreviate a little bit, but the idea is the following. If we take C bar, a smooth um, complex curve, um, and we take a point P in C bar, and what we're really interested in is the complement. Uh, so we've got a curve in which we remove a point. And the whole idea of this is that you want to take a base point at the point P, which you're not allowed to do because you've removed it. So the idea for getting around that is, so how do you define a, a base point at a point that's not in the space? Well, you don't. You, you take a tangential base point. Um, I, at, at P is simply a non-zero vector. So it's convenient to write it with an arrow to emphasize it's a vector in the tangent space of the compact, the, 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 the sort of the, the, the filled in curve C bar, um, which is non-zero. So we think if we have the point P that we've removed and we have some tangent vector sticking out of it. And the point is that this, this perfectly well plays the role of a base point um, in, in every setting that we care to think about. And it will define fiber functors on various categories of local systems or algebraic vector bundles and so on. Um, so since I'm slightly short of time, I'll just explain um, how you can define a notion of fundamental group and then, get, and then explain the tangential base point that we're using. And the rest of the discussion I will postpone until uh, when I look at periods. So uh, what, what is a path? A path from this tangent vector to another point in the curve is the data of a continuous map into the curve which is continuous, but also differentiable at 0, such that almost the entirety of the, the, uh, the interval, so except the initial point, is actually contained in the open, in the complement C bar minus P. So let's call this C. And um, the initial point is uh, P, and we specify that the initial velocity of this path should be given by the tangent vector V. And the endpoint is Y. So you think of this in the obvious way. You've got um, 
point P here with a, a vector sticking out and a point here at Y. And so a, a path from this tangent vector to Y is a path that goes from P and goes to Y such that the initial velocity of this path is, is given by the vector V. And um, that defines, um, so out of this you can define a notion of uh, homotopy between paths and you can define fundamental groups. So there's nothing to stop us in this definition. We can, we can even take Y to be a tangential base point and th the definition is the same except that you, you enter with minus, the final velocity is minus the vector at, at y, so it's the, the obvious definition. And so there is a notion of homotopy, homotopy of such paths. So homotopy is a continuous deformation, but which preserves the, the, um, the, the, the condition of the derivative at, at the initial and possibly end points. Um, and so then there's a notion of pi 1, the topological pi 1 of C, uh, so this is the space of paths from the tangent from the tangential base point to y, and likewise there's a notion of even fundamental group of paths based at vp. So a loop based at this tangent vector is what I said. It's a loop that does something and then comes back with a negative in the in the with the final velocity minus v bar. Okay, so um, you, you can do everything that you normally do with base points, with tangential base points. Um, let me just explain what the tangential base point that will play a role for us will be. So we have the disk. The unit disk is the set of points Q and C such that 0 less than Q Sorry. So it's the disk, <coughs> the open disk, open punctured disk of radius one. Um, and then there's a um, an orbifold isomorphism of the upper half plane modulo stabilizer of the cusp at infinity is isomorphic via the map. Q equal e to the 2 pi i tor to the disk stack quotient by um, z mod 2z. So this is not the same thing as the actual quotient of d star by z mod 2z. And from this then, so this, um, this, this uh, group is a subgroup of SL2z, so this orbifold has a map to m11. And therefore, we get a map from the disk, the actual disk, to the orbifold quotient and then onto M11. So, um, what is our tangent vector? So, d by dq is, which is going to be our base point, is the unit tangent vector at zero on the punctured disk. So we have our picture of the punctured disk with zero removed and its tangent vector sticking out of zero like this. So of course we're, we're here working with a stack to, um, to work with tangent, tangential base points. It's the same as usual. We, we work to the, we, we can pass to some covering and, and view the tangential base points on the covering. So um, with that said, another way to think about this, or equivalently, um, on the upper half plane, what does this tangent vector d by dq correspond to? It corresponds to, so if I draw a picture of the upper half plane here with the real axis and the imaginary axis here, and then the sort of, let's put the cusp infinity up here. 
then um, this tangent vector corresponds to a tangent vector sticking down like this. And so sometimes I call this um, 1 at infinity. So it's a unit tangent vector in, in, in the coordinate q at infinity. And um, some people write this d by dq. So um, either way, we have there's a canonical tangent vector, which is going to give us our tangential base point, and there are two different notations for it. Um, so this also defines this fiber functors on, on various categories of geometric objects on M11. Um, so let me write um, Vn is it's the same Vn as before, is the Betty local system we defined earlier. We can take its fiber at d by dq, at this tangent vector, and it's the vector space I wrote down earlier. And likewise with Duram, I'm going to call this Vn Duram. So in, in the Betty case, I, I, don't, I don't put a superscript. I just drop it. <coughs> right, so at long last, now we can talk about um, relative completion on the space M11. So of course, a lot of what I say is completely general. Um, but we're really only interested in this particular space. So um, the category of local systems of finite dimensional Q vector spaces on M11 and is equivalent via the functor d by dq. So we take the fiber at d by dq. I didn't completely explain how to do that, but I'll do that next time. Um, and that gives you a finite dimensional um, Q vector space plus a gamma action. That's an equivalence of categories. And so what we're getting then is a map. So if, if we apply this to um, V1 Betty, so this is just the, the, the local system of the cohomology of the universal elliptic curve. I'll fundamental building block, then what this is going to get is a, it's going to give us a vector space with a gamma action. In other words, we get a map from M11 fundamental group with respect to the, this tangential base point, and it's going to act on um, That act on the fiber of V um, at d by dq. And um, so this is a map rho. And what we get then is a map rho from gamma, which is SL2z, into SL2q. We get a, an explicit representation of SL2z with respect to this basis x and y. OK, so that's the, if you recall from last time, relative completion involved a homomorphism from a group into the rational points of an algebraic group. And that's what it is. Oh, I've got a board here. Sorry. So so this is the initial data for taking relative completion. Now, to define. The Betty relative completion, we're going to define a category. Um, let me call it just curly C, um, whose objects are more general local systems on M11 and um, equipped. with a uh, filtration, so finite, exhaustive, increasing filtration 
of sublocal systems. Um, so zero equals L zero containing L one up to the whole space, such that the successive quotients are the ones that we that we know and love. So the, each successive quotient is just a direct sum of the um, canonical ones that we defined at the beginning. So these are the nth symmetric power, I remind you, is the nth symmetric power of essentially H1 of A. So uh, I called it H, I think. Um, right, so these local systems are, are iterated extensions of uh, these building blocks. So their semi-simplification is a direct sum of these symmetric powers. But we're going to look at successive ex non-trivial extensions between these local systems. So this is a Tanakian category. Um, and it has a fiber functor. Um, omega d by dq, which is take the fiber of such a local system at our base point, and that gives a map to um, um, an exact tensor functor to vector spaces over q. And then, <coughs> therefore, from this we define um, g the Betty relative completion. So now the notation is going to be G11 because it, this 1-1 this one one means that we're looking, on, looking at M11. One one. And this is defined to be the automorphisms of this fiber functor. So this is um, the Betty relative completion. Um, and it's an affine group scheme over Q. So very concretely, it means that its, it's, uh, its affine ring is just a commutative Hopf algebra over Q. And, and by the, the, the Tanaka theorem, this category C is exactly equivalent to the category of representations of this group. Um, so it's extremely clear. In fact, it's, it's the same group as the one I defined last time. Um, so we can see that because we have a functor. In fact, we have this equivalence of categories from local systems to representations. So there's a functor from this category C to um, gamma representations, which is take the fiber at d by dq, but by contrast with the previous functor, we don't forget the gamma action. So before we had a fiber functor that just gave a vector space, that factors through this functor, which to C, the category C, associates the corresponding representation of the fundamental group by well, its action at the fiber at infinity. And that, that, that induces, in fact, is completely obvious from the definition if you translate everything back into representations, you get exactly the definition I gave last time. And hence, we get a map from gamma rho. So this was the, the relative completion of SL2z relative to the representation rho that I defined last time. And it's going to be canonically isomorphic to this Betty relative completion. So this is just another way to say that the Betty relative completion is simply the group theoretic relative completion. They're exactly the same thing. But what we've gained is that we've, this geometric interpretation gives us um, more, more information. Um, and therefore, as I explained last time, um, the action of gamma here acts on the fiber functor back there, and therefore gives an automorphism. And so we have a canonical map 
from SL2Z into this group, into the rational points, and it's Zariski dense. So we've got some huge um, affine group scheme, some huge projective limit of algebraic groups, and sitting inside it densely is the group SL2Z itself. <coughs> and that's, this is the main tool we, we have for understanding the, the Betty side of things, is that it's some, some algebraic hull of SL2Z. So now for the Duran relative completion. I have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so now we define, in the analogous way, a category A of algebraic vector bundles on M11. So I remind you that we can think of this as G, uh, sort of graded or algebraic vector bundles on M1 vector 1 scheme with a GM action with integrable connection and regular singularities at infinity, i.e. at the cusp, um, equipped with a filtration. So it's the same definition, really. 0, v0, v1, vnv. So this is v. So the filtration by by sub by sub algebraic sub bundles equipped with an integrable connection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Etc. Don't want to repeat everything, such that the uh, successive quotients are isomorphic to a direct sum of the um, the mth symmetric powers of the Gauss-Mannian connection on the cohomology of the universal elliptic curve. Again, so these are basic building blocks, and we're looking at connections which are <coughs> iterated extensions of such things, all possible iterated extensions. And this has a fiber functor um, and at, uh, given by the tangential base point at the cusp. And we define the Duran relative completion to be the automorph automorphisms, the tense automorphisms of this category with respect to the fiber functor fiber at d by dq. So this is called the Duran relative completion. And again, it's a, a group. It's an affine group scheme over Q. So um, actually, maybe I'll keep that. So as I mentioned last time, these, these groups have um, unipotent radicals. which are pro-unipotent algebraic groups. So sometimes it's convenient to write, so we d write the unipotent radicals as U. And these SL2s are not the same. I mean, th there's an isomorphism between them, but it's non-trivial. So it's convenient to denote these copies of SL2 with different superscripts, SL2 Betty and SL2 Duram. It saves a lot of confusion. Um, so now, uh, proposition is that there is a canonical isomorphism between these two group schemes. So comparison so over when you ex when you uh, extend scalars to the complex numbers, these groups become isomorphic, canonically. And this comparison involves integration. So it will produce lots of periods. And these periods are very interesting. And they will be 
uh, what I like to call multiple modular values. So the proof of this, um, I'm out of time, so I'll just say it, it's, it's, it's kind of clear, it's just the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence between local systems, um, or Deleen's version of the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence and algebraic vector bundles, and you just need to check something on the X groups, so use the fact that X1 C V M Betty is H1 M1 analytic V M Betty and in the category in the Duram category A the extensions of the trivial object by Duram are given by the Duram and and clearly the com the the, the, this Riemann-Hilbert correspondence induces the comparison isomorphism here, which is an isomorphism. That was the, the theorem that, that, that was um, I wrote down earlier. And you can check that um, this is actually enough because um, this, this group is actually, the underlying Lie algebra is free. So if you have a map between unipotent groups whose Lie algebra is a free Lie algebra, and who, which is an isomorphism on generators, then it's an isomorphism. So that's very easy to show that. Um, so that was a, a very heavy-handed proof. But um, So what is the structure of these groups? Well, I, I mentioned this briefly at the end of the last lecture. So we can compute the cohomology of the unipotent radicals. So the cohomology of the unipotent radical and the Betty thing is the direct sum H1 gamma Vn tensor Vn dual, where well, I remind you that Vn is this, this vector space of dimension n plus 1. It should be thought of as the fiber at d by dq of this local system. And similarly, for the Duram, it's H1, it's the algebraic Duram cohomology tensored with Vn Duram dual, where Vn Duram is, is the fiber d by dq. Okay, and, and there's no higher H2. No higher cohomology. So, as we've seen, th these by Eichler-Shimura or whatever the, the comparison isomorphism, the, these things are built out of group co-cycles. These things are built out of modular forms, essentially. So, th what this rel relative completion is? It's SL two, some sort of trivial piece, and some huge pro-algebraic, pro-unipotent part that is built out of modular forms. So, let me. Um, and so then, therefore, we should think of this comparison isomorphism is, we should think of it as a, a non-abelian generalization of the generalization of the eichler shimmer isomorphism. Right? Um, so another way to say it is that the abelianization of this group um, gives back exactly, so the, the, if you um, restrict this to unipotent radicals and pass to the abelian, just the abelianization, which is very small, then you get back exactly the, the comparison isomorphism I wrote down earlier. So in the very last minute then, let me um, write down the Lie algebra then. So U11 Duram is something very con concrete. It's the, the Lie algebra of this unipotent group. Um, and you can, a pro unipotent group is always isomorphic as a vector space to its Lie algebra. So from this description, we know that its homology, in other words, its generators, is isomorphic to the product of this algebraic Duram cohomology, dual tensor Vn Duram. So what it is, therefore, because the higher cohomology vanishes, this is a free Lie algebra, 
And so it's, it, it's the completion of a free Lie algebra on generators given by classes here. Let me just write them down and stop. And ne next time explain how you can put a, a mixed hot structure on this. So the Lie algebra is, has the following generators. It has, we can denote them by symbols. You're going to get a, a, an Eisenstein, up here you're going to get an Eisenstein part of the algebraic dram cohomology, and, and it's going to come with a copy of this vector space Vn. So this is an SL2 representation. SL2 is the, the quotient SL2. This is, so we get a, an SL2 representation indexed by an Eisenstein series. So E is some symbol which represents Eisenstein series um, G 2n plus 2 of weight. Sorry, uh, G, so n is going to be even, weight 2n plus 2. So we get Eisenstein series give us generators, but we also get generators from cusp forms. And because the cusp forms um, occur with multiplicity 2, we're going to get um, we're going to we can take a, a basis like I had this basis delta and delta prime earlier. We can choose a basis E F prime and E F double prime. So for every Hecker sort of cuspidal Hecker eigenspace, if you like, actually no, let me take that back. For, for, for every cusp form, we get we get we get two. I don't want to talk about Hecker eigenspaces because I'm not. I'm working over Q for now. But for every cusp forms, we get two generators um, in correspondence with a choice of Q basis of cusp forms of weight 2n plus 2. So that's it. So um, in this, in this uh, Lie algebra, you have the simple generators correspond exactly to the classical theory of modular forms. And then the next Thing, interesting thing that's going to happen is that you're going to get Lie brackets of two, of two such guys. And they're going to give periods and they're going to give objects. Um, and that's what I mean by the non-abelian theory of modular forms. So I'll stop there. <laughs>